Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello and welcome to today's lunch hour lecture. Uh, we had Trump on Tuesday, and it seems we've got his colleague uh, today. I'm very pleased to introduce Peter Duncan from the UCL School of Slavonic and East European Studies, um, who's going to um, give us his lecture. How Putin reacts, ideology, power, wealth, and security in Russian foreign policy. So over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, John. You can hear me? Um, good. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for giving up your very precious lunch hour to come and listen to me. Um, and I'm sort of flattered that I'm squeezed in here between Trump, the day before yesterday, and cancer this coming next week. Um, I, I'd say that so it's not a bad analogy, not a bad uh, placing, because the situation in relations between Russia and the West is probably worse now than it was for most of the Cold War, more, more dangerous in any sense. Um, the, what I want to do today is to talk is, is in more or less three parts. First of all, about what the nature of the regime is in Russia since Putin came to power at the end of uh, 1999. Um, then talk about Putin's view of the world, his ideology, and finally give some examples of how Putin reacts in international affairs. So starting with the nature of the regime, um, by the way, where's the clock? I can't see the clock. Ah, oh, there it is. Thank you. Good. Um, <laughs> good. Um, starting with the nature of the regime, um, corruption, informal rules, patron-client relations, these aren't really a problem for the system. They are the system. Um, corruption has always existed in Russia. Uh, in the 1990s, um, after... Uh, when Yeltsin came to power, is this working? Hi. It's coming. Oh, good. Is it coming? Yep. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Now I'll try and get this straight. This is Boris Yeltsin. But please, can I show his clenched fist? Great. It doesn't quite uh, fit in, but this is... <laughs> Thanks, John. That's, that's it. Good. Um, so Yeltsin... If those of you who remember, old enough to remember, that Yeltsin was the president of Russia after, straight after the Soviet Union collapsed. And under him um, we began the process of privatization, which led to uh, power being concentrated uh, in the hands not just of the state, but also a group of oligarchs, as they were uh, well known to us in London, the um, people who combined political power and wealth. Um, but the end of uh, 1999, uh, Putin became acting president on the way to becoming president. And his, uh, what he did was to bring down the power of those oligarchs that had been around uh, under Yeltsin, but brought in a new uh, corrupt group, um, partly of his uh, friends from St. Petersburg, and partly a group, uh, if I want to, um, if I can use one Russian word tonight, today, uh, the Siloviki, these are the people who were, uh, uh, literally it means people from the power structures or the coercive structures. People who are in the KGB of the USSR uh, and or its main successor, the FSB, the Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation. And Putin, as you know, uh, was, spent most of his career in the KGB and under Yeltsin he went on to become head of the FSB. And in 2003, uh, that's uh, three years after he'd um, uh, come to power, the nearly four years, uh, Mihal Hadakovsky, who was the richest man in Russia, the oligarch who, who uh, was, who'd, uh, owned the company Yukos, the largest oil company in Russia, was arrested, um, not just for his uh, political activity and his opposition to Putin, but also because uh, one of the predominant Siloviki uh, uh, wanted to add Yukos to his own Russian state, uh, state mainly state-controlled, uh, mainly state-owned, state-controlled oil company, Rasneft, which is later on became the largest oil company in Russia with the, with the uh, accession of Yukos. And so al already from there, we can see the beginnings of the use of the law for the private interests of the seal of key. And then a couple of years ago, when Rasneft uh, decided it wanted to take over Bashneft, uh, the then owner, 
uh, didn't want to be taken over, so he was put under house arrest until he agreed to give over his company to Rusneft. And just a couple of days ago, the Minister of Economic uh, Development has been arrested and charged with corruption. Uh, nobody seriously in Russia believes he is corrupt, but he'd done something to upset uh, Putin. He'd uh, openly opposed the idea of, um, of uh, further consolidation of Rusneft's expansion, especially in relation to Bashneft. And uh, the Panama Papers that uh, got, were publicized in this country because of the role of David Cameron's father, um, they also showed how people around Putin were doing very well um, and had sent money abroad. So in, in some way we can say this is a criminal regime. It's also an authoritarian regime. The, under Yeltsin, uh, we saw the first steps towards this. It's not simply a feature of the Putin period, but under Yeltsin, way back in 1993, he was forced to break up the, uh, the parliament. And under Yeltsin, uh, not to, just to break it up, but to uh, at least 150 people were killed in the process. Um, and uh, uh, on top of that, he started two wars in Chechnya, to, which involved um, massive repression of those who were seeking independence and resisting uh, Russian power. And in 1999, um, thanks, John. Uh, 1999, at the end of 1999, when Putin came to power, he came to power on the basis of the Second Chechen War. He'd shown his uh, strengths as an organizer to uh, begin to defeat the Chechens this time. And, but the war began after a series of bombings that uh, of blocks of flats in Moscow and other cities. And uh, the, these were bombings of civilians uh, were blamed on the Chechens. But many people in Russia be believe that, uh, in fact, this was, uh, these bombings were carried out by the FSB in order to uh, create a war situation uh, and then bringing Putin to power. Um, on top of that, since, uh, since Putin has been in power, the Kremlin has taken over control of the main television channels, uh, over the main political parties, and now effectively controlled by the, by the Kremlin, and those that aren't, aren't allowed anywhere near power, control of the regions, and indeed the whole political system. And there's growing intolerance of any sort of criticism of opposition. Uh, people who have spoken out have uh, not just lost their jobs, but in several famous cases, uh, been murdered. Uh, Anna Polakovska, the journalist in Moscow. Um, Alexander Lipinenko, the uh, former FSB agent who was involved in exposing the, um, uh, the uh, proposing the idea that the FSB had carried out bombings of the blocks of flats in 1999. He, you may remember, died here in University College Hospital. And uh, just last year, former Deputy Prime Minister, the Liberal Boris Nemtsov, was killed in, in, uh, in Moscow, very close to the Kremlin. So um, all these three uh, people had been involved in exposing uh, events connected to repression in Chechnya. Um, and certainly the, uh, the head of the uh, Republic of Chechnya, who Putin uh, put there, has been quite active in uh, threatening publicly people who criticize Putin. So we have now in Russia an atmosphere of fear. And this atmosphere of fear and repression is the reason why the, uh, the protests that did begin in uh, 2011, after the fraudulent uh, uh, elections to the State Duma, why after Putin came back and reinstated the repression um, after if I can very briefly mention um, Dmitry Medvedev's presidency. Um, after Putin came back, the, uh, he uh, got control again and stopped the, uh, most of the protests and intimidated people from taking part of them. So what we have here, he was only there for, he's still the prime minister, but he was only president for four years and not really much power, so we can put Putin back quickly. Um, that uh, uh, what we have essentially is a criminal, kleptocratic, authoritarian regime uh, for, focused around Putin and enriching him and his friends.
Now moving on to Putin's view of the world, since coming back in 2012, the ideology uh, to try and explain uh, the ideas behind its reaction. And unfortunately, Putin's view of the world today is, um, is rather reminiscent of the Stalin era, the idea of capitalist encirclement of the only socialist country. Um, and or, uh, even uh, Lenin's idea of the, of the Bolsheviks being in a besieged fortress with a hostile world, especially a hostile West. The difference, of course, with the Cold War is that, uh, uh, one of the differences anyway, is that uh, Russia, in this sense, is a much more open society and the elite are very happy to buy property in the West, which of course would never have happened under Lenin and Stalin, uh, send, the, send their funds to the West, we mentioned the Panama Papers, um, and even send their children uh, to the West to be educated. But nevertheless, they, uh, the, the regime, Putin and his colleagues, um, see America and NATO, and NATO, by the way, they see essentially as an extension of United States power. They see uh, America and, and NATO having shown a lack of respect for Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, see the Americans as portraying themselves as the victors in the Cold War, and taking advantage of Russia's chaos and its economic weakness in the 1990s to create a, a unipolar world dominated by the United States, in which the United States can do what it wants in international affairs. Um, and uh, above all, what uh, Russia has uh, sees as NATO doing bad that is against Russia's interest is its enlargement into Central and Eastern Europe and into the former Soviet Union, despite the assurances that were very clearly given to, thanks John, uh, given to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in 1990, when, uh, when the Soviet Union, which Gorbachev was then the president of, when the Soviet Union agreed to accept the German unification within NATO on the basis that NATO would not enlarge uh, beyond uh, beyond the border, even, that it existed between West Germany and East Germany. In other words, there would be no eastward positioning of NATO forces, even within uh, what had been East Germany, let alone Poland, uh, what was then Czechoslovakia, uh, or the Baltic states. So, um, in general, one can say that not only the Putin regime, but Russians generally, I think one can say, apart from a small liberal group uh, of, of pro-Westerners, generally think that the West, uh, and NATO and the United States in particular, took advantage of uh, Russia's weakness to expand uh, NATO's and American influence at Russia's expense. On top of that, a whole series of other reasons why the, uh, uh, Russia has been upset by Western activity. The uh, interventions in Yugoslavia uh, in the 1990s, bombing of civilians in Serbia, and then chopping up Serbia, giving Kosovo independence. The war in Iraq uh, carried out without the sanction of the uh, United Nations Security Council. Now I'd say in Britain, more or less universally recognized as having been illegal. Uh, the abrogation of the anti-ballistic missile treaty um, by George Bush, uh, this, what that meant was that the United States was seeking nuclear superiority over Russia. Um, the Western criticism of human rights violations in Russia, while not criticizing violations in other countries that were allied to the West, such as uh, Saudi Arabia, for example. And then perhaps most importantly, what um, has, apart from NATO enlargement itself, uh, what has upset the Russians were the colored revolutions, as they're known. The revolutions in states that formerly belonged to the USSR, formerly inside the Soviet Union, um, particularly the 2003 Rose Revolution in Georgia and the 2004 Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Now, these were protests against electoral fraud by authoritarian regimes in these states, which led to the overthrow of these regimes. And these protests have Western support. But Russia saw, saw what was going on as Western intervention, that suggested and believed, actually, that the revolutions were caused by Western intervention even though the reality was that these revolutions had, were rooted in 
protests of the population in Ukraine and Georgia. But then, both in Georgia and Ukraine, the new governments wanted to join NATO and the EU. So this sort of claimed, uh, sorry, sort of confirmed the fears and claims of the Russians, and in particular the regime itself, which feared, I, I think quite uh, sincerely, however wrongly, it feared that the West was going to try to carry out some kind of colored revolution inside Russia itself. And the activities of the European Union, uh, the Eastern Partnership, the association agreements um, into the uh, countries formerly within the Soviet Union were also seen as intervention in what uh, Medvedev, who I took away, has called uh, Russia's sphere of privileged uh, interests. But um, generally, one can say that Russia has... Can I put Putin back? Thank you. Uh, generally, thank you. Uh, generally, uh, Russia has accused the United States of ignoring national sovereignty and national law with its unilateral interventions in U Yugoslavia, Iraq, and now adding on now Libya and Syria. Um, and one should add that China, and I would say the majority of less developed countries, do agree with Russia in this criticism of the United States um, for taking elect, uh, unilateral action without the support of the UN Security Council. So Russia sees itself in its self-image, in its, in its ideology, as a defender of international law, of sovereignty, of traditional values, and also, uh, and when I say traditional values, I don't mean just mean international law as it was uh, left at the, um, at the end of the Second World War, with Russia having a seat on the Security Council, but traditional moral values, uh, what they call the family, what they call normal sex relation, sexual relations, which means heterosexual relations, uh, defends of religion. And Russia sees itself as a bulwark against terrorism, whether it's um, the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or Daesh in Syria and Iraq. On the other hand, the Euro states of the European Union are seen as decadent and corrupt, giving up their national sovereignty, both to the European Union itself and to the United States and NATO, and the, the uh, European decadence is shown by the fact that they, they've fallen away from religion, um, they encourage gays, uh, supposedly, they encourage paedophiles, supposedly, and terrorists. So, but Russia sees its main task as to restore, it, restore itself as a great power. Uh, Putin uh, desires that Russia be a strong state, and at the center, of the Eurasian Economic Union, which is made up of authoritarian states, which were formerly part of, the, some of those which were formerly part of the Soviet Union, as a rival to the European Union. And public opinion generally shares this view of a hostile West, um, because the Russian public on the whole gets its information about international affairs from television, which, are, as I said earlier, has been controlled by the regime. But when you hear stories that 80, 85 percent of the population of Russia support Putin as such, as opposed to supporting his resistance to Western encroachments. Uh, you, should, you should take these figures with a pinch of salt, because these public opinion polls are conducted on the whole by, some, by people on the phone. The sociologist on the phone rings up the person um, and asks questions, including, do you support Putin? And the point is that if you're a Russian person, you're rung up by somebody you've never heard of before and ask you to support Putin, you say yes. I can't at all understand why Western commentators who sometimes usually know what they're talking about, they completely miss this point. So when you see these figures about Putin's high ratings, please reduce it down. My estimate is that he's probably got about half the support, the support of about half the population at the moment. Um, so finally, you not seeing the clock, sorry. Uh, finally, um, how Putin reacts. Um, Putin himself takes all the major decisions in Russian foreign policy. Is he still there? Good. Um, yeah, um, good. Uh, he, um, d d except of course when Medvedev was president, I won't bother putting him up again. Um, one has to remember the quote that he uh, used after the annexation of Crimea, that um, what he learnt when he was fighting on the streets as a poor boy in Leningrad was to hit first and hit hard, or words to that effect. Um, 
uh, on the whole, w w and uh, I can come back to this if you like, but the Putin is, is really a tactician. He's never been a strategist who's been able to work out a long time strategy and stick to it. So I'm, in giving you examples, insofar as I have time still, um, I'm g giving you some examples of how he reacted to particular situations. So first of all, the um, 11th of September 2001, the uh, terrorist attacks, Al-Qaeda in, in America. Uh, Putin straight away joined uh, George Bush's war on terror because uh, he wanted to stop Western criticism of the war in Chechnya. He wanted to present this as part of the war on terror, but also um, he wanted to use the war on terror and cooperation with the United States to assert Russia's international position after the weakness that uh, Russia showed Andy Yeltsin when uh, it hadn't been able to stop um, NATO from uh, inter intervening in Yugoslavia, for example. And Putin wanted to get Western investment in Russia, trade with Russia, and Russia as a member of the World Trade Organization. And all this was despite the uh, anti, the widespread anti-American feeling in Russia at that point, um, and indeed the opposition of mo most of Russia's political elite, elite to cooperating with the, with the Americans after what they'd been doing in the Yeltsin period. But Putin uh, believed that this was necessary, um, and he, he, this is how he imposed his, his own views on the whole foreign policy, policy structures and on the military. But from after 2003, uh, relations with the West, the United States, came down for the sort of, I mean, deteriorated uh, for the reasons I've already referred to, such as America's quest for nuclear superiority, missile defense, uh, NATO enlargement, and the colored revolutions. And then the second event I want to mention, the uh, April 2008, the NATO Bucharest summit, at which NATO said that um, it wasn't enough that uh, uh, most of Eastern Europe had been allowed to join NATO and Central Europe and the Baltic states, that Ukraine and Georgia would be allowed to become members of NATO as their governments wanted. It did not set a date when Ukraine and Georgia would be allowed to join. So Russia, the task of Putin at that point and the elite was to find a way of stopping Georgia and Ukraine from joining NATO. And so what happened was that in August that year, Russia managed to provoke a war with Georgia, which showed that NATO was incapable of defending Georgia against Russia. And after that, the NATO plans for Georgia and Russian membership have been put on indefinite hold. Um, the background, the economic background to this is that after the rise in oil prices, Russia was much stronger economically than it had been in the 1990s under Yeltsin. It was now seeking a new security situation in Europe, and not one dominated by NATO and the EU. And what Russia has wanted uh, since, since then, since the late 2000s, is a clear moratorium, at least, on NATO and EU enlargement into the former Soviet Union territories. Um, third area I want to talk to, uh, talk about is uh, Ukraine. Ukraine, one must emphasize that for most Russians, Ukraine is seen as part of Russia, not as a foreign country, as part of Russia. Um, in March 2014, uh, Putin annexed the Crimea from Ukraine, added it to the Russian Federation. So this, why was this such an appalling act, in my view? because it was the first case of one country taking territory from another country in, inside Europe since the border changes at the end of the Second World War. So there had been cases of countries falling apart, of splitting up, but this was the first case of one country taking a part of another country by military force um, since the Second World War. 
and so and it was a violation of the of international law which Russia had always claimed to support uh, the United Nations Charter the Helsinki final act and at least three agreements with Ukraine itself so why how to explain this this action and uh, this is the the, the, the main reason, as far as I can see, was that Russia, and the Russian military in particular, feared, using Sevast feared that they would lose Sevastopol in Crimea, which is the basis for the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Because after the events of the Maidan, which was another revolution in Ukraine, in February 2014, when... President Yanukovych fled Ukraine. Um, the new people, the new people coming to power, threatened to throw the Russians out of the Crimea. Um, if Russia annexed Crimea, then uh, Russia would no longer have to every so often negotiate with Ukraine about uh, how much rent it would have to pay for the base and face the danger that it might be thrown out. But if, on the other hand, it did annex Ukraine, then the Black Sea Fleet would have a permanent base. And so, in other words, Putin hadn't had a plan at the beginning of February 2014 to annex Crimea. This was simply a reaction, a tactic, to, the, to what had happened, the Maidan Revolution. Also, this punished the leaders of Ukraine for the Maidan Revolution. Discourage anyone else from starting a revolution. You start a revolution, we take away your territory. Um, so very much linked up with the authoritarian nature of the regime. The consequences of this are, yes, right, very quickly now, thank you. Um, the consequences of this were that uh, Putin's popularity inside Russia certainly soared. Um, and he had this illusion that he could take over uh, large parts of southern and eastern Ukraine. Um, but, uh, and, and hope to maintain popularity this way. Um, but then it became clear that there wasn't the support in the rest of Ukraine. So he actually dropped the idea um, of Novorossiya, of annexing more parts of Ukraine. But because he'd, created, because he'd created through the television and been carried along by this wave of nationalism, he couldn't simply abandon those territories where separatists in, in the Donbass had actually taken power. And meantime, Putin could see uh, the impact that uh, both of the Western sanctions, even more so the fall in the oil prices, that he would like to get out of, uh, out of the Donbass, keep Crimea certainly, but get out of the Donbass. But because he'd made this, uh, tr this tactical error of encouraging briefly the separatism in the rest of southern eastern Ukraine, he was now in a serious economic position. I'm just going to say one word about Syria, then I'll stop. John, is that all right? Thank you. Um, so Syria, in September 2015, why did Russia begin the military intervention? This was a reaction to the, uh, the information he got from the Iranians that if Russia didn't act uh, by bringing aircraft and starting to bomb, then... Uh, the rebels, not uh, Daesh, not the so-called Islamic State, but the other pro-Western, pro-Turkish, pro-Saudi uh, uh, rebels would be likely to capture Damascus. So, uh, again, Putin responded to the, the, the threats. Uh, he didn't want another dictator to fall. Uh, at the same time, Daesh is a, is a home of terrorists, and many, several of these, thousands of these terrorists in, in uh, the so-called Islamic State now are actually from Russia. And by intervening against them, Russia is, is uh, pursuing its anti-terrorist um, uh, policies, um, not just in the Middle East, but also inside Russia itself. At the same time, it, uh, Russia defends not just a dictator, but the um, naval base in Tartus and uh, which has the, been there since the Soviet period, um, the only, at the moment, military base outside uh, the former Soviet Union for Russia, apart from the new ones it's now building in Syria. 
And also, it prevents the growth of American power in the Middle East and shows both the public opinion inside Russia and the Americans' Russian strength. In the hope of getting a deal with the West and the removal of these uh, sanctions that are really causing Russia and the economy to get further and further away. But the main factor I want to get across is uh, in the Syria is to prevent regime change that's driven by the West, either in Syria or in Russia, and to preserve in Syria friendly dictators. So Putin essentially is following the interests of the regime, uh, not of the, the Russian people, who would benefit greatly by cooperation with the West and the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Actually finished. Thank you very much, P Peter. Um, could I have the uh, title slide um, uh, back again? Thank you very much. Uh, we're joined by in questioning by um, uh, uh, people on, on, on the internet. Um, the event code is there, hashtag 1487 and on Slido. Um, and uh, now we're, uh, Peter says he's uh, open to critical questioning. Well, as indeed are all our lecturers anyway. Um, so. Um, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a question there, anxious to come, and then we'll... Look the Hi, thank you. Um, can I ask how you think the current uh, political change in America might change the West's relationship, particularly with relation to Trump, um, with Putin? Gosh, Cla Claudia, thank you so much for that question. I'm sorry I didn't have time to talk about Trump, but, but um, uh, the, clearly they, Trump and Putin have got a lot in common. Um, in terms of their support for traditional values, which, by the way, is proclaimed but not uh, observed by them. By them, they both understand um, that they uh, it's all right to talk to pronounce traditional values, but also to have to get divorced, which of course is against the decision, the positions of the churches they claim to belong to. Um, and from a political point of view, the uh, clearly uh, Putin is very glad that Trump has been elected. As far as I know, this is the first case um, of Russian intervention in the, on any significant scale in an, in an American presidential election, both in terms of, um, of changing the program of the Republican Party to remove any criticisms of Russia um, through the people who had been linked up with Putin and Yanukovych, who were working as uh, Trump's advisors, and through the hacking of the emails in, in the Democratic Party. So they start off with a great deal in common, um, as well as their, their machismo, what's the word, macho um, uh, attitudes and their nationalism. And Trump's willingness to, uh, to pull back on America's international activity, um, whether it's in East Asia, it's interesting, the first uh, politician he's going to meet is from Japan, the Prime Minister from Japan today, apparently. Um, but the, but his uh, uh, lukewarm, I would say, commitment to NATO, and above all, his talk that uh, uh, the sort of intervention that we saw um, under Clinton in Yugoslavia, under Bush in U Iraq, and uh, other parts of the Middle East, and uh, in Syria under Obama, that that's not going to be, in, in his perspective, Trump, uh, Putin is very much going to welcome that. And so, but I'm afraid that that won't last because I suspect that Trump, because of his belief in a strong America, America having to have the greatest uh, <coughs> army in the world, not in the, plan, in the um, uh, greatest army in the world, that uh, he will want to insist on missile defense, in other words, on American nuclear superiority the capacity to destroy Russian nuclear missiles, in other words. And that will really upset Putin and Russians in general. As far as the West is concerned, um, well, the, we, one thinks, I mentioned Japan, but the, uh, which of course has its own territorial dispute with Russia, and they're very anxious to make sure that Trump will defend <coughs> Japan against Russia. Um, but the European Union, which is the other pillar of the West, 
is now clearly in a period of decline. Um, the, the Brexit uh, is really uh, affecting the whole prospects for European, of the European economy, not just the British economy, of course, above all for the British economy. But it means that the European Union will, is much less able to act coherently. And while Britain is and remains a member of the European Union, uh, British governments have usually been on the uh, hawkish side in relation to Russia, and particularly in relation to the uh, sanctions on Russia over Ukraine. Without Britain, then I suspect that that situation will change. Also, also other, some of the East European countries and uh, South East European countries may also um, uh, be un unwilling to carry on with the sanctions. Russia, as uh, hardly anyone's noticed, but just this last week, both Moldova and Bulgaria have elected pro-Russian presidents. In other words, Russia is in a uh, in an increasing position um, in Europe, and, and Britain's action in Brexit, of course, is luck for it's Putin's lucky he didn't bring about Brexit. Um, but these things are actually working in his favour. Thank you. Yes, there's a question behind you. Just there. Hi, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, I'd just like to pick up on um, Russia's influence coming back into Central and Eastern Europe and challenge your, uh, your last comment there about mm. the presidents being pro-Russian. Um, wouldn't you say that actually the situation there is more about moving, particularly in Moldova, about moving away from the EU, or are you really seeing a swing back towards Russia? Well, the, the new Moldovan president, uh, Igor Dordon, have I pronounced that right, um, has said that he would like Moldova to become a member of the Eurasian Economic Union, and that's exactly moving towards Russia. Um, that doesn't mean it will, because the key figure in both uh, Moldova and in Bulgaria is the Prime Minister. So um, I would be sounding alarmist if I hadn't said that now. So thank you for giving me a chance to say that. Um, the uh, Bulgarian, well, but, but also the Dordon has talked about coming to some sort of arrangement with Transnistria. And that suggests, uh, which, sorry, Transnistria is the part of Moldova which um, is, uh, has separated itself since 1992 since 1990, actually, from Moldova, uh, with the support of Russian troops. And the new president has said that he would favor some kind of settlement with Transnistria that would give it a special position. So all that sort of plays into the, into the Russian agenda. Bulgaria is, is very divided, as, as is Moldova, um, with the Socialist Party being more pro-Russian. But as the Bulgarian prime minister has resigned, and there, there may well be, am I right on that? Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> uh, prices of conscience. Um, the, if there are elections in Bulgaria, the Socialist Party comes to power. It's, it certainly won't leave the EU. It will, it'll still stay in NATO. But it'll be more open. And inside the EU, I think it's going to be more likely to be one of those countries to be arguing against sanctions. So that'll be a great help for Russia. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.